Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you all for taking your time out of your busy schedules to spend a couple hours with the network center and our partners to discuss basically all things IT. Um, like the introduction said, my name is Jason Dahl. I'm a senior security engineer for Network Center. I've been working in IT, like they said, for about 25 years. Um, I do all things security. I love it. So what I'm going to cover is seven key security bases for all small businesses, but really it's all business should do this regardless of the size um, when it comes to these three, three, you know, these seven areas. Um, so first we're just going to start out is the, what is the largest vulnerability on your network? It's actually your internal users. Um, users unknowingly cause the majority of all cybersecurity incidents. So that's why training your individuals once a year or more is so important because training to help your employees literally are your first line of defense when it comes to security. And they actually are considered a larger part of your security team because again, they're helping us security engineers and security people. Um, you know, when you get a malicious email or you get something suspicious, the first person you turn to is your security team. But without you, the employee, we don't know. So again, we're not watching things in the background. So I understand that a lot of people are like, oh, I didn't sign up for this to be a part of the company, but unfortunately it's part of the digital age and where we're going. And your employees must be able to spot malicious URLs, spot phishing emails, and possibly malicious attachments. Um, you know, through my time in IT and everything, cybersecurity over the last 20 years has changed so much where at one point, it was just simply you could put a firewall in, it blocked your traffic, you were good to go. But now, literally, your attack surface is so large. I mean, it can literally be any program, any process, any file, anything can be a threat. Um, so can we stop every cybersecurity threat? No, we can't. But what we can do is we can make it difficult for the attacker to continue a long, drawn-out attack. And that's by... Um, again, training your individuals so they know what they're looking at and so they know that they're not clicking on something that they shouldn't be. Um, within the organization itself, your senior leadership, your legal team, HR, accounting, and information technology are the biggest targets within your company. Each one of these groups holds a key to a resource of some type that attackers and hackers, again, they love to steal, sell, whatever. And again, the attackers are literally only looking for a quick buck. There's nothing sinister about it. It literally comes down to dollars and cents, and, and that's it. And here, what I did is I went and I found a couple of articles regarding you know, what the black market for some of these items actually are. And as you can see, you're like, okay, a credit card, social security, $5. But again, that's an attacker saying, you can use these two pieces of information and get a credit card and it will work. And a lot of times they actually build in to the black market rate that if you don't get, you know, that credit card or that social security number does not work, they will actually refund your money or they'll give you a new social security number or credit card. Um, so this is just kind of breaking it down. But as you see, even with the logon credentials for an unhacked Windows server using RDP, that means that they can get to it but they have not ultimately exploited it so that you really don't know that it's exploited. And again, they'll sell it to you so that you can use it for an attack somewhere else. So a lot of times too, is that with these RDP sessions, it's European or Russian hackers, for instance, will use a RDP server within the continental United States. And what that does is that stops geo-blocking. That again, is a way for the attacker to get around certain security practices that we put in place to stop them. But again, if you have an individual that can go from Russia to a continental United States computer and then launch the attack from that server, again, all those things that you've done are no longer going to work. And it and it's really comes down to just one click of a phishing email could take a company down for months and cost tens of thousands of dollars to recover from, which is even scarier that it can be just that simple, but it honestly is that simple. So when it comes to those types of things, you know, training 
your individuals so they know what they're looking at. Because again, everything has a cost in your company. You may, you may think like, hey, I'm small, I don't have to worry. No, everything has a cost and an amount to it. And again, you may not think that, oh, we're only this small of a company. They won't, it, 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 it honestly does not matter. They will go and get as much money as they can from anybody. Even my dad, who is a small business owner, um, has been fished. And again, the only thing that was good with him is that he really didn't have anything viable. So what he lost really didn't matter. Um, he really didn't have to pay a ransom or anything like that. We just basically restore his computer. But again, that's where um, training comes so viable for your employees. The next area we'll talk about, which I'm sure you've all heard of, is multi-factor authentication. So what is multi-factor authentication? It's a multi-step account login process where you provide your username and password, and then a secondary factor is being provided. So that means you are either providing um, you know, something you know, which is your password, of course, but then the other part might be something you have, a credit card with a chip or some other device, like a token uh, card that I'm sure some of you have seen as well. Or the last thing is something you are, a fingerprint or, for instance, like your cell phone, a face ID. So with that, your, you know, that's your biometrics type of thing. So that's your two factors, something you are, something you know, and something you have. Those are the three factors total, but two of them make up the multi-factor. Um, I have yet to seen anybody actually utilize the three factors, all three of them at once, um, but I do know of government systems that do actually use all three. Um, so implementing an MFA, regardless of the size of your organization, is vital. It keeps your network secure as possible. Again, it is not a silver bullet, but again, it's all about reducing your attack surface as small as possible to basically have the attacker look at you and say, look, this can be too difficult, let's move on to someone else. Um, but what also MFA is kind of, you know, back and forth is that you can't just blindly accept an MFA alert. You, you have to know that there's something that you did that required that secondary authentication. So either as you went to a website or you clicked on something and it came up saying, hey, I need you to authenticate again with that secondary piece of information. Um, so the one thing is, is that if you're getting these alerts and you haven't clicked on anything, well, you shouldn't be accepting the alert. It's about trying, you know, and even at that point, your employees and users need to understand is that, okay, I'm getting these alerts, I'm getting a lot of them, I'm getting them at midnight, one in the morning, whatever. This is not you doing anything to make it happen. This is a third party trying to get you to accept that secondary factor. Because once you accept that secondary factor, because the user can figure out your password, they can do all of that through you know, brute forcing and other things like that. But that secondary factor is really what would stop them from getting into your network. Um, like I said, if you're getting an MFA request at midnight and you're sleeping, that is not you creating the request. That is someone somewhere requiting the request to try to get you to click on it. Um, so one of the things that we do have is it's called MFA fatigue. It's for what happens is when a, you'll see continuous alerts coming up, constantly hitting you going, okay, well, this is not me doing this. But eventually some people just get tired or there's, they don't really think about it. And again, it's no fault of their own because again, these, these individuals are very persistent. They're going to continue to do this until you click okay or you change something to make it so that it no longer pops up. Um, the one good thing that has happened, you know, even in the life cycle of MFA is that the providers like Microsoft and Cisco and Amazon and all the other ones that you may use, they've started to take more of an active role actually in helping with these alerts. So I know Microsoft just recently announced that they're going to start to try to block these suspicious MFA alerts, um, which is fantastic. The only downside is, is that yes, eventually the hackers will find a way around it if you're doing like the push notification for your MFA or something like that. Um, one thing at NCI that we do is we do number matching so that when you click on a link or something happens and it requires that secondary factor, it will pop up with a number saying number 43. I go to my phone, I look at my phone and say, okay, yes, number 43, I enter it. 
And then that's telling me, and that's giving me the checks and balances that tells me that it was me requesting this authorization. Um, so that's also one of those secondary factors that we're looking at. Um, so again, it's, it's important to let your employees know why they're getting the MFA alert. And then also, Lee, it's just important to implement MFA because again, it will reduce the chances of a brute forcing or someone finding your password. Because even with passwords, we're all creatures of habit. I know I shouldn't, and I shouldn't say this in front of everybody, but I do reuse the same password. Again, I may change a number or a symbol, but a lot of the times it's the same structure of the password that I have. Um, so with that, you know, you just have to be mindful of when you do set up MFA, try not to do the push notifications, more go to the number matching MFA, because um, again, it will help with overall fatigue. And then you'll know for a fact that when I type in 43 and that number matches, it's you doing it. So that's the other, you know, the one thing that I'll say about MFA is that it's, it's fantastic, but you do still have to, you know, make sure that you're paying attention to what you're actually allowing, what you're actually doing for that secondary factor. Um, number three, which is always another one too that we hit on big, is keeping all of your devices up to date on current hardware and software. Um, this means your firewalls, your switches, your routers, your um, servers, that are their firmware printers, all of these things need to be updated on a regular basis. And trust me, I know because I have to do a lot of these updates that a lot of the time it is very taxing and it's a lot of work just to try to figure out, okay, what is this device? Where do I need to go download this? Because it's some random door lock that we purchased somewhere, but you know, what do we, how do we stay on top of it so that we're always updating this door locks? And again, this comes down to the evolution of cybersecurity where again, it's no longer just one thing that they'll attack the firewall. Now they can literally attack anything that's on your network and they can utilize anything on your network. Because even if it's, let's say an APC power supply, which they do require updating frequently sometimes, um, it still has an operating system on it. It still has a way for someone to hold a persistent connection within your infrastructure. And again, a lot of these things are not um, looked at every day because we just don't, you know, we put them in, we set them, we forget them. You know, it's the infrastructure part. We're not interacting with them every day. And, you know, that's one thing it's that it's important to know what's on your network and make sure that everything that you have, that you are making sure that they're getting updated appropriately, or you're segmenting these things off into other areas of your network. You know, air conditioning units, you know, is another one. That's how the target hack started was through an air conditioning unit. Um, so again, it's all about knowing what's on your network and what can talk to what. Um, when it gets to VPN clients, this is another area that um, I've seen many times where they have a VPN client, but again, it's just not looked at all the time. So one of the things I would suggest is that making sure that these things stay up to date and regularly updated is have an alert of some type to say, hey, let me check quarterly or monthly, or again, you know, just signing up for alerts from that manufacturer to show you um, where these things are. And then it's vitally important to make sure that if your P VPN device has gone end of life, that you replace it because that means the software manufacturer, you know, like Cisco's and the Fortinet's of the world are no longer updating that device. They're no longer going to give you updates. So that means it just sits there and it's never going to get updated. So then eventually a hacker is going to find a way into that device. Um, continuing with that, um, what I would suggest in a lot of areas is prioritize these devices on a five year budget to replace. Because again, they will, no matter what, all equipment goes end of life. And with that though, you're also by updating it, you're aware of that, that cost coming up in your budget. I mean, even five years, six years, seven years, but at least have some type of budget set aside that you know in five years, you need to replace this piece of equipment. Because again, it is gonna go end of life. But then also the good thing is, is that when you do upgrade for one, you're ready for it. It's nothing, you know what's on your budget. But then what it also does 
is when you update these new things, you're gonna get new features, new items that are going to help you uh, in the long run for your overall cybersecurity. So it's very important to stay ahead of the game on this when it comes to that. Um, and then again, like I said, you know, make sure that you sign up for some type of alerts for your devices. Uh, all major manufacturers will release alerts and things like that so that you can go through them and update them, you know, when you need to. So that's, uh, you know, very important when we look at the overall devices and making sure they're updated within your organization. Um, because at the end of the day, even if you do that one click, the attacker still needs areas to jump to um, to get within. So if they get within and they have a persistent connection either within your firewall or your VPN or something, um, that's what they're looking for internally is a device that is not updated that they can take over and then hold that persistent connection, meaning they can stay there pretty much unlimited because nobody's going to stumble across them as they're sitting there. Uh, the next item I would say is reduce your software footprint. So what am I saying with this? When we have three browsers, for instance, all three browsers need to be updated and continually updated. And a lot of times, as I'm sure all of you have, we all have our favorite browser that we like to use. For me, I like Microsoft Edge. But again, I know that's Chrome and I know it's Firefox, you know, or it's a Chromium. But again, I don't need Chrome. I don't need Firefox because of the fact that I'm just using Edge. So by reducing the amount of software on your systems and you're reducing the amount of software you need to update. And that also takes your attack surface from being this big conglomerate of software from all over the place. And you're just trying to make it as minimalistic as possible to help you with your overall security. Um, when I say don't install production software on your servers, basically what I'm saying is don't install Word, Excel, or other productivity stuff on your domain controller or PDF uh, reader on your domain controller. Microsoft Edge works just as fine. Of course, I know there's an exception to the rule when it comes to terminal servers, because again, that's what it is. It's for you to log in and then do some type of productivity, Word, Excel, things like that. So it's but again, even on your servers, it's important to not install programs just because you simply think they should be installed on there. Try to make your servers as minimal as possible with very little third-party applications installed on them. Yes, I know that there are third-party software that you'll need to install, but again, if it's a SQL server, just have SQL on it. Again, smaller businesses need to combine resources. And even with that, it's fine to do that as long as you're doing it within certain parameters, you know, like if it is a domain controller, it's fine to do DNS, DACP, another other infrastructure device type applications to help your server, that's fine, that makes sense. But again, if it's a SQL server, try not to have Active Directory also on it because of the simple fact that if they were to take over your Active Directory right there, they have your SQL and they have all of your information all at the same time with one click. Um, another thing within reducing your software footprint is actually implementing application control. Um, the reasons why I'm bringing up Windows Defender application control, because it is a built-in feature for Windows 10 and Windows 11. Um, this is honestly the most effective way I have seen ransomware attacks stopped. But you do need to make sure that it's set up for strict control. But even as you're setting up, these things and and right there is a, a link to kind of show you if you want to take a look at how you would set up application control within your environment um, microsoft does a really good job but this is honestly the best way that i've seen ransomware attacks stop um, with those things and then again you know when you do this you know your computers are in compliance but if let's say user B needs some type of new piece of software to do their job, that's fine. Let's just make sure that we properly vet this piece of software and then add it to our application control. And then that way too, you're also within your IT department, you're keeping a good watch on what software is actually getting installed on your network. And again, you know, removing admin permissions and things like that also will help 
in that process. But again, having some type of control over what's being installed on all of your endpoints is vital. Um, Cause again, it helps when you do reduce it to a minimalistic approach, you know, it helps you not have to worry about all these other random things, because again, you know that you have control on those applications and you're limiting to what can be installed on the application rather than having to blanketly say, nobody can have administrative rights for your local endpoint. Because again, with the application control in place, that would actually just help you in that long run of those things. Uh, number five, develop a basic incident response plan. Again, this is regardless of the size of your company, but it's so important to know what it takes to run your day-to-day -day operations. Disasters happen every day, and I'm not talking just IT disasters that happen every day. I'm talking any kind of disaster that could happen. Um, so it, it helps that you're in control of these things. Um, and also, don't get hang, hung up on, you know, I need to make sure that my spacing is right. Just literally bullet statements, hey, if our servers go down, I need to contact these individuals. Um, when something unexpectedly happens and our phone system's down, okay, who do I contact to get this back up for one, but why and what do we need to do to help our overall plan? And it's important to know that um, as many employees that should know do know, that they know that, hey, if, if we do run into a situation where um, something went down for the day or we had an electrical storm and it took out our servers or what have you, you have a way and a thing to say, hey, as long as I can get my email back up and this file share server back up, we can continue normal operations for the most part. Yes, we're reduced until we get these other key items up, but it's also just important um, to have some type of a plan um, that you can go off of so that when something happens, you're taken care of and you're not running around with your hair on fire trying to figure out the day that the disaster happens. Um, you know, it happens all the time. I know it's, we're all busy and doing these things you know, at the end of the day, you're like, oh, you know, we should be fine. But at the end of the day, when something bad does happen, this allows you to come get back to work as normal faster. And just by having a basic plan, it doesn't need to be anything pretty, like I said, just a basic plan of some type to help you through um, whatever may be going on. Uh, number six, Implement system hardening guidance. So system hardening guidance is what it is. It's hardening. It's basically an industry standard for the best practice to ensure the maximum protection for your organization. So that's, again, tools and techniques, best practices to reduce the overall vulnerabilities. I would like to say that all vulnerabilities are patches, but that's just not the case. Um, sometimes it's a registry key change. Sometimes it's an edit in a um, Linux file that needs, you know, config file needs to be changed. Sometimes um, it's just on a router or a switch, something about encrypting how a password is shown in the show run of a Cisco router. So again, all these things are important. And the great thing is, is that, you know, Center for Internet Security, they have done a great job of going after all kinds of things. So literally when you go to their site, they have instructions for operating systems, applications like Apache, HTTP, IIS, SQL, um, network stuff, so routers, switches, firewalls, all of those have guidance that the industry has, the Center for Internet Security has talked to the industry saying, okay, what can we do to help protect this server or this endpoint or this application just a little bit more? And with that, the CIS guidance um, is probably the best one that I have come across. You also have, um, you know, for those in highly regulated areas like banking and stuff like that, when you do compliancy with those items, those are basically, again, best practices that that industry has said, this is the way you need to set up your passwords. This is how you need to set up your server or what have you again it's all about compliancy and making sure that you're taking these best practices and implementing them for your organization to help you 
with whatever you know you may need. Um, and the great thing with the CIS is these guides walk you step by step through how to set this up. And as you set them up, it's also explaining, well, why am I doing it? Why am I setting this? And in the documentation, it says, you know, the reasons why you're doing this is to prevent brute force attack or prevent someone from, you know, getting a password off of a config. So again, it's just taking those items and then making it readable and making you understand that these are things that we can do to help guide us to the best security practices that we can do. Um, if you were to implement the Center for uh, Internet Security, CIS, I suggest the level ones. And the level ones are basically stated within the documentation, are practical and prudent, they provide a clear security benefit, and they will not inhibit the utility of the technology beyond acceptable means. Meaning that it is not going to brick your server or tear it down if you were to set these items. Now, even within, let's say, the Windows 10 or Windows 11 CIS benchmarks, there are certain items that are level ones that you still need to pay some type of caution with. These would be things like how you uh, encrypt your network and how the encryption is done. SMB, not small business, but SMB for server message block, which is how Windows servers communicate for file shares and things like that. Um, those types of things, it does take a little time and extra care and feeding to make sure that when you are implementing some of these items, that you're not, again, taking down half of your network. And again, as you roll through these, I know I've done it a number of times. And again, it's all about taking small bits and pieces at the time. So for me, I normally will roll the first 25. I'll you know, put it onto the network, step back, wait, make sure nobody's having any issues. And then again, it's just that slow, diligent process of rolling the items and then making sure, because you will have settings that you set that maybe Adobe doesn't like. And now you're opening a PDF file and it's not opening the way it used to be, or it's not letting you copy things the way it used to be. So then those are things that you can say, okay, does this pose a threat? Do we feel it's a threat to our organization if I copy and paste out of a PDF? You know, a lot of times, no, it doesn't. But again, it's all about knowing what you have on your network and how you want to handle everything. So again, CIS benchmarks, um, I recommend even just, you know, downloading like the Windows 10 or 11, you know, the prominent operating system probably we all are using by downloading that and just going through and reading it and kind of understanding, okay, this guidance is telling, you know, doing some things and it's showing me what I need to think about as I start to secure my network um, as we go through, you know, this whole process. Um, so then lastly, domain name service DNS. Uh, do not use public DNS servers. So this would be the Google DNS, you know, 8888, 88.444, um, And the reasons, well, here, let me go back, sorry. What DNS is? All computers use numbers to communicate. DNS was invented to help us not have to remember that number. So we associate with a name like Yahoo. So Yahoo is tied to an IP address. So instead of us having to remember the IP address, because Yahoo has many, many different IP addresses, we just need to remember www.yahoo.com. So how does DNS ultimately work? Well, it works in reverse order of how you actually type. So when you type out www.yahoo.com, um, most people don't listen. Actually, after the com is there is a dot, but it's automatically done, so you don't need to actually do com dot. So the root is the actual dot, and then followed by that, it's the organizational grouping. So commercial organization, government, US, you know, country code, things like that. So then from there, it goes to your organizational name. So it'll go to Yahoo, Google, Microsoft, or whatever you are. And then finally, it goes to the web server. So www, login, whatever else you may have at the front of your URL. Um, and then, like I said, that's how it's searched is .com, .yahoo, .www. And that's how a DNS server actually does its lookup and you know, shifts you around with the different IP addresses in those types of items. 
So why am I saying do not use public DNS servers? So moving to open DNS or a similar service, what these individuals do and what these private DNS servers do is they actually prevent employees sometimes from connecting to current or active malware attacks. Um, these servers monitor threat intelligence attacks. They remove or block URLs from getting access. Um, and then at the end of the day too, if you do pay for the service, you can get a list of all the URLs that your employees are going to. And for me, from a security standpoint, it's not that I'm gonna go and look at the URL saying, oh, Jim is going to ESPN.com every day of the week. I don't know why he's so obsessed with ESPN. Um, I wish he was this obsessed with work. But what it actually does for me, it allows me to look at uncommon URLs that are popping up. So I can go look at a URL and say, you know, is this something that we would normally be connecting to on our day-to-day -day operation? It may be something that Jim found new that it's a new website that's great that may help other employees within the company. But again, it also may show me that, hey, this is a malicious link or this is something that's going on that I need to pay more attention to or I need to block this URL because maybe OpenDNS or some other private DNS server has just not gotten to that point yet. Um, so again, it's not really, I don't consider it spying on your employees. You can take it that way. Um, but for me, I would use it more for where are my servers going to? Because again, even in the background, you have agents on your computer that are connecting to URLs to update, to do multiple different things, to add you know, signature files and things like that. So this is all happening in the background. So it may not be you typing out the URL, but if I have an agent that was just installed on the application or you know, an application installed that's going out randomly, checking for these random URLs, okay, well, why is it doing this? Why is it making all these requests to this random URL or the URLs changing continuously? That tells me that maybe there is something malicious on this computer and it allows me to investigate a little bit more. I mean, at the end of the day, I may find out that, oh, it's an agent for Arctic Wolf that is just going out and it's just checking with Arctic Wolf to make sure that it has the most up-to-date signature. So right there, I flagged the URL saying, no, we've researched it. We know where it goes. We know what it does. Now, don't get me wrong. Google DNS is a great resource to test. But you also have to remember that attackers and hackers also rely on the same public DNS servers that we do to do this testing and do these lookups. So that's why, again, malware, a lot of the times, is utilizing these public DNS servers because, again, even malware utilizes DNS because if they were to utilize an IP or something like that, again, an IP, IP rotates. So again, by using a URL, they can change their IP address continuously to stay ahead of um, law enforcement or other types of individuals that are trying to track them. So that's another way, again, to kind of look at how getting away from public DNS and moving more to private DNS can help you in the long run and actually um, prevent some, not all, but prevent you from going to current or active malware attacks or other items that may be causing issues on your network. Um, so with that, I mean, to wrap up, you know, these seven items, again, are not all inclusive. I'm not saying that if you do these seven that you will have the best network in the world. No, because again, it's always evolving. You know, we're always changing what is happening in IT, especially in security, because once we find something that, again, I can do this and we're gonna block these, geo block these individuals from Russia. Okay, but now that these individuals figured out that we're doing this, they're going to start at another location. They're just gonna go one more loop. So it's all about staying ahead of people. And again, by limiting your attack service, by limiting the applications, by making sure that your equipment's up to date, by educating your users, all these things play into your overall cybersecurity hygiene. And they make sure that at the end of the day, that you're staying ahead of the attacker. Again, it cannot stop everything. I'm not saying it can, but it can greatly reduce your attack service and your 
you know, your ability out there in the world. So with these attackers, they'll see, hey, this is, we've tried to keep a connection here. Um, we're constantly getting disconnected. To be honest, they're just gonna move to the next easier site. Because again, it's all about the payday or what they can utilize from your organization to ultimately um, stay persistent connected to your network and um, yeah, stay, yeah, stay connected.